By Friday evening, the 2017 CBMC President's Council was well underway, setting the stage for a momentous keynote address from the tour guide of The Truth Project and host of the documentary Is Genesis History, Dr. Del Tackett. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be with you uh, tonight. I, um, I always have a, a sense that I need to begin with some sort of a caveat here with you. Uh, I am normally listed as a speaker, and I, I'm not a speaker. I'm, I'm a teacher. And there's a radical difference between speakers and teachers. Uh, you know, speakers have this very well-honed narrative and they have it down cold, and it takes us to the height of emotion, and, it, it, and we laugh, and it, and it drops us, and we, we cry, and at some point we don't know whether to laugh or to cry, and then just as the speech is supposed to end, it reaches this great crescendo, and, and we all jump to our feet in a in loud ovation. And teachers aren't like that. We, <laughs> We simply teach until the bell rings, and then we quit. And, but I, uh, I really have a sense that I'm not even a teacher anymore. I'm, uh, as, as Phil said, I, I really see myself as a, a tour guide. Because it isn't about me. It's about the jewels in the cave. It's, it's about calling people's attention to the character and the nature of our God. And so there is nothing that I enjoy more than taking people on a tour and looking in the rear view and mirror and seeing them hanging out the window, uh, ooing and awing at the jewels in the cave because it really is all, all about him. I have a, a title for us to, to ponder tonight, to, and to some extent it's, it's all in uh, the title. The, everything we're going to talk about here is in the title, and I, I'm, I'm calling it Living in a Land of Not. Now, what that means is a land where there is no ought. Living in a, in a land of not, uh, a remnant of hope. Okay, so the, and I'm uncomfortable up here. Is that okay if I drop down here. I, would, I really would rather be engaged with you. I'd feel much better if I had a whiteboard that I could draw on. Um, I don't, I don't really, I'm not here to entertain. I don't care about entertaining. What, what I care about is to see the, the body of Christ uh, get healthy. And the only way we're going to get healthy is for us to turn and gaze upon the face of God and have him radically change us. That is our number one quest. Our number one quest is the people of God is to know him and to know him more fully. So I have long been fascinated with the encounters that finite man has with the infinite God. Uh, you are familiar with these. Um, some of these encounters are uh, not pleasant. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar encountered God and, and uh, he found himself out in the field on all fours eating grass like a cow. Uh, Jonah encountered God, and he ran away and encountered a big fish. And so I'm fascinated by these because, uh, first of all, recognize and understand that when God encounters finite man, there is inevitably a revelation of who God is. And these are moments, these are precious moments for the children of God to better understand who he is. God never does anything that he has to slap his forehead, like I do. I, I, do, this, I do this probably a hundred times a day. You know, you know, why did I say that, or why didn't I do this, or so forth? God never does that. Every time God speaks, every time he acts, he is consistent with his nature. And so when God acts, that is an opportune moment for us to understand more of who he is. And so when he speaks to man, when we have these encounters, and one of my favorite, for those who've been through the Truth Project, we 
we referred to this encounter that Isaiah had in Isaiah chapter, uh, chapter 6 when he en encountered uh, the living God. Now let me recount that for you because I want to draw your attention to something in this encounter that I think is so profound uh, for us to gaze upon and to consider uh, here uh, tonight. Isaiah wrote about this, and he said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were the seraphs, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they were flying. They covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And, and they were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple filled with smoke. Woe is me, I cried. I'm undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. When we come into the presence of God, there are three things that happen to us. The first is that it exposes us, and we do not like to be exposed I think that's exactly why, when we did the Truth Project, uh, we mandated, we tried to get people to realize that, do the Truth Project in a small group and pray for them. If you don't pray for them, there's nothing magic in the DVDs. Because we're going to do everything we can to try and turn people to gaze upon the face of God. And they will have a tendency to run away, just as you and I have a tendency to run away. And that is why lone Christianity was not part of God's plan. Jonah, it's not, it's not unusual for us to realize Jonah appears to be alone when he ran from the face of God. And we have a tendency to do that. We don't like to be exposed. None of us do. And, and Isaiah writes as, as to what this did to him. And immediately he recognized and understood in his, in his being, in the essence of who he was, that he was a man of unclean lips. Woe is me, I'm undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. Did you, and you notice God didn't have to say anything. And you all are mature enough to know this. When you come into the presence of God, God doesn't have to say anything. That is why people fall down on the ground when, when, when an angel appears there is something about just the presence of God, the holy presence of God that exposes us. And that is something we don't want. We're not comfortable with that. But the child of God desires to be exposed by God. But we have to recognize we live in a world where people do not want to be exposed by God. But the most, even more difficult than that is, is the second thing. It exposes our culture. Woe is me, I'm undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and, and I live among a people of unclean lips. You see, we're exposed, and then all of a sudden we begin to see and hear the weeping and the moaning and the groaning. One of my great heroes of the faith is William Wilberforce. If you've seen the movie Amazing Grace, even though they only went halfway in the story, William Wilberforce was exposed before God. And then all of a sudden he began to hear the clinking of the chains on the slaves. And he began to smell the stench of the slave ships. Does that mean the clinking wasn't there before? Oh, no, it was there. He just couldn't hear it. Does it mean the stench was not there before? No, the stench was there. He couldn't smell it. And so when you come into the presence of God, 
All of a sudden, we're exposed, and now our culture is exposed. And we don't like that either. We don't want, we, because we live, we live in a Hollywood world. We, we live in a Hollywood world where we just, we fawn over everybody. You know, we fawn over each other. Oh, you're so sweet. Oh, your hair looks so young. Know. And I don't mean to be critical here, but that, that's the way it is. We, we don't do negativity. Everybody is fine. And so we don't, we don't want to talk about things that are bad. We crank the music louder, and we go on. And the third is that it calls us to action. I, I interrupted Isaiah. Let me, let me continue. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth. And he said, see, this has touched your lips. And your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the Lord say, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, here am I. Send me. So the third thing that should happen when we come to the presence of God, we're exposed, our culture is exposed and then we say, here am I, send me. Now, there's something, there's something strange uh, about this encounter. And this is what I want uh, initially for us to look at because we want to gaze upon the face of God here. There, and there's something strange in this encounter that I want to call your attention to, uh, to look at. And it's, it's in these words. And see if there's something, what's strange about this? And, and don't treat me like a, a speaker. You know, a speaker asks a question, and then you just sit there and wait for the answer. Uh, when a teacher asks a question, expect an answer. So, so here, let me, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, let's, we'll read through this. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Now, what's strange about that? What's strange about it? He knows. What's that? He knows. he knows the answer. He knows the answer. So, yeah, there's something strange about God. When, see, when the infinite God comes into the presence of finite man and he asks these questions, some people have wrongly assumed that God doesn't understand things. Remember back in the garden when, when, when God said, Adam, where art thou? I mean, is that, do you think God is saying, where is that little rascal? You know, he was, he, he was, he was just here not long ago. No, no, when, when the, inf the infinite God who knows, who is omniscient, who knows even your thoughts, who knows the beginning and the end, he is omniscient. We don't even understand that. He is omniscient. But when he stoops, the, the Hebrew word is shvela, it's really he humble. When he humbles himself to engage with finite man, he asks a question not because he doesn't know, but because he wants to provoke something in us. Yes. He wanted to provoke Adam to say, I was naked. And to begin a dialogue. And so, yes, God is, who said that? Did, did you? Yeah, great, but that's not it. Okay. All right. So what's strange about this? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? What's strange about this? Pardon me? The singular I? The plural us. This, is, this has to be, it's my, my opinion, that one of the greatest aspects of the nature of God is that he is socially complex. Allah is not socially complex. He is monolithic. The gods that men make are monolithic. Yet the true God is socially complex, that he exists in this triune form, and just like we, we saw in the garden, 
when God said, let us make man in our image, there was a socially complex plural form that was speaking of this triune nature of God. And here we have, in this interaction with Isaiah, both the singular use, whom shall I send, and who will go for us. Now, when, when Jesus came, and then in, in the, uh, the Holy Spirit, as he moved the, the writers in the New Testament, we became more clearly in, in our, th- we became more clear in our thinking of who this triune God is. So, triune God, awesome, but that's not it. <laughs> what? Whom? Shall I send? And who will go for us? Why does God send? See, remember, we're after, we're after understanding who this God is. That's what we're after. We, that's our quest. When we see God speak, we hear him speak, we see him act, we want to know who is this God? Why? Because we love it. We want to draw near to him. We want to know him more closely. And so when he asks the question, whom shall I send and who will go for us, to me the strange thing is that God, who is infinite in power and knowledge and wisdom and all that stuff, that he should send. How many of you, and I know many of you are very accomplished, you're to some extent maybe from a vocational perspective, you've risen to the top and so forth, but how many of you think you can do a better job than God can do? I'm still looking for that person who will say, hey, I think none of us would say that. Do you think God could do do it more efficiently than we could do it? Do you think he could do it more effectively? Do you think he could do it more in line with his purpose and his plans? Of course. So the question is, why does this perfect, holy, omniscient, um, omnipresent, um, omnipi, omni, omni, omnis of everything, <laughs> send finite, self-centered, pitiful creatures to fulfill his purposes and plans. Well, that, sir, may be the, the key answer. We are, we are attempting to film, we're praying, and you can pray with us, that God will give us the ability to film the follow-on to the Truth Project teaching. The, the Truth Project was meant to build a biblical worldview in the body of Christ. God has blasted it. The estimates over 15 million people have been through the Truth Project. There are, it's been translated into Arabic. Uh, there are small groups in the Middle East. Um, there's even a Persian translation, um, French, Spanish. Who would have guessed? Because we, for those of you who started out with us in the Truth Project, remember we kept a very close wrap on who could get the Truth Project. And the reason was because we wanted it done in small groups and we wanted those people committed to pray for the people because they didn't care about the number of DVDs sold. What we cared about was a transformation of God's people. And so this, the engagement, and this is, I've been wrestling with how in the world I could try to put this in a thumbnail for you tonight because the bell is going to ring before we know it. That we are, we're going to attempt as best we can to turn and gaze upon what I think is the crown jewel in the nature of God. And we're not going to expose that crown jewel until tour um, three in the engagement, actually tour four. And the reason is because I don't think we're ready for it. I don't think we're ready to gaze upon the crown jewel of God until we plow the field first. Um, but the crown jewel is what you just said. And so we're going to jump ahead here for, uh, for you all. And you'll see this in, in just a minute. And the, and the deep implications for that, and, and to some extent the great remorse that should befall us 
that we have neglected so great an aspect of God's nature and misunderstanding what that aspect of God's nature is. So who is this God? This is our, our ultimate quest. And what are we to do in the crazy times in which uh, we live? Because uh, we do live in difficult times, do we not? They're crazy times. Sometimes I, I, I just wonder who pushed the crazy button. It's just sometimes unbelievable and how rapidly everything has, uh, has changed around us. Do you remember uh, one of those great commentaries on some of the mighty men in David's time, the sons of Issachar, there is that great passage that says that the sons of Issachar, Issachar understood the times in which they lived and knew what Israel should do. The Hebrew word for understood is, is bana, And it's not just knowing. It's not just a knowledge. It's, way, it's deeper than that. It's a, it's a wisdom, uh, it's a discernment, it's a deep, deep ability to see what is really behind all of this. That's what that word bana means. And the sons of Issachar, bana, the times in which they lived, and they knew what the people of God should do. And I think this is important for us because we live in difficult times as well. Do we banal our times? Do we know in a banal kind of way what is going on around us? Because I, I mean, I'm a military guy. I served 20 years. I spent some time flying. And the fundamental way that you, you approach issues like that is that, first of all, you need to know what the problem is. Because if you don't know what the problem is, then your solution is just going to be some shotgun approach. And so I think it's, a, it's important for us to be wise, to banal the times in which we live. And so I, I want to spend just a little bit of time with you gazing at, at some uh, of those things uh, so that possibly we, we should know what we should do. And, and our place in the meta-narrative uh, uh, of God. I... I took this picture during the total eclipse, and uh, I will tell you, it was an emotional moment for me. We had just, we had finished uh, the Genesis film, and we had done that uh, because there is a, a movement in Christianity uh, to walk away from the historicity of Genesis. And once that has gained foothold in our seminaries, uh, it is processing itself into uh, removing Adam and Eve, that Adam and Eve are just some hominid group. There was no real fall, and that's what happens. That's what happens anytime you, be, anytime you change any aspect of the scripture that is supposed to be historical narrative, written by God in a historical narrative genre, and you turn it into myth or analogy or so forth. You do the same with the, the resurrection of Christ. You've probably heard some of these things. It was the resurrection spirit, you know, that kind of a thing. He really didn't raise from the dead, but it was the spirit of resurrection, you know, that we should all... Um, hum uh, with crystals or something, I don't know. But <laughs> So what, what overwhelmed me at, 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 at the moment that the moon perfectly covered the sun was the oughtness of the world around us. That the sun and the moon are in perfect proportion and distance from each other. The moon is the perfect size for our planet, the perfect distance away. The sun is the perfect size, the perfect distance away. And, and the world would say that's all a coincidence. Why? Because the world does not want to have any kind of a designer or creator or ought associated with the way things are. And so, you know, we read the scripture, it says the heavens declare the glory of God. And one of the ways it declares the glory of God is the order, the order of what he has made. So I want to speak first of all about the transcendent ought that God has revealed himself and in his word and, 
and in his creation to us. Um, I know that there are some of you who remember this mission. Uh, my main reason for going into the Air Force to fly was because I wanted to go to the moon. I wanted to be an astronaut. And the, the Lord obviously didn't want that to happen. Apollo 13, if you've seen the movie, it's a, it's a great story. It's one of the great, um, great hero stories and rescue stories of our time. But you recall, now Hollywood has iconicized this phrase. It's not exactly what was said, but... You know, there was an explosion in the command module, and, and all of a sudden, uh, there was a call, uh, Houston, uh, we have a problem. Now, here's an interesting question. How do we know that we have a problem? Okay, I know that we have a United pilot here in the room, and I don't know how many other pilots we have, but for those of you who have never flown before, this is the cockpit of the, of the uh, F-5 or the, the T-38, and it may look to you like they put, see the cockpit is not uh, created with all those gauges to confuse you. <laughs> you know, the, the manufacturer doesn't say, hey, let's, let's make another gauge and stick it up over here. That'll really confuse people. No, the gauges in a cockpit are there to tell the pilot what is. What really is, the pilot's job is to know what ought to be. And if the is strays from the ought, it's the pilot's responsibility to do what he can to get the, the aircraft from the is to the ought. Does that make sense of what I just said? Okay. So that's... That's what uh, the gauges in the cockpit are to tell us, but it demands that there is an ought. Now, we, we live in a strange world, and so I've thought about this, and I wondered, what if, what if the astronauts had called Houston, uh, we have a problem, and Houston had responded and said, um, Roger, that Apollo 13, we read you, but we think you're being a little negative. <laughs> so let's not worry about it. There's a big game tonight, and well, we think you should just press on. Consider it the new normal. <laughs> Love you guys. <laughs> and if the astronaut said, uh, hey, copy that, Houston, we were good to go then. Uh, pipe the game up, what would have happened to the astronauts? It would have died. Absolutely, they would have died. But the astronauts and the engineers and all those people on the ground knew there was a problem. And they knew there was a problem because they knew the ought. And they knew the spacecraft, the is of the spacecraft, was way off of the ought. And, of course, they spent 24-7, and those guys came back. What a great, great story. It really is a great story. But, see, we live in a culture that increasingly says there is no ought. There is no transcendent ought. We don't want there to be an ought. And we'll talk about why in just a minute. We don't want an ought. And therefore, we don't need any gauges. And we especially don't need any of you Christian gauges to tell us that we're off, that we're wrong. We don't like that. That's the culture that we are increasingly living in, the land of not, no ought. We don't want an ought. So, now, we, I could ask our United pilot to come up and talk about the death spiral, but I'll, I'm not going to relinquish my <laughs> tour guide position. So, Oftentimes, what happens, not often, but sometimes, if a pilot fails to 
keep scanning his instruments. And he basically is looking outside. Sometimes you can get a false horizon, what's called a false horizon. It's a cloud bank, we'll say, a cloud bank that looks like the horizon. And so you begin to fly as if that's the horizon. And you fly, if you fly long enough, then your body believes this is level. And you look at the gauges, and your gauges say, you are in a, a steep right bank. And so you try to correct, but your body tells you you're now like this. And so a death spiral will occur when a pilot begins to trust his own feelings and ignores the gauges. And so we find ourselves, I think, in a culture that's in a death spiral because we, we really don't want to see truth, we don't want to hear truth, and we don't want anybody to speak truth. You take a look at some of these uh, statistics. Uh, we produce 90% of the world's pornography, our, our, our culture. This nation, we produce 90% of the world's por pornography. Every day, we kill more babies than we lost in 9-11 at the towers. Every day. We lead the world in crime. Uh, the family. There will be seven marriages this year and four divorces. Half of our babies are born to unwed moms. It's a play we have a plague of STDs. Uh, we're hooked on entertainment. Uh, you know, Felipe, you were, you were talking about, the, yeah, that was very, that was uh, chilling. The list of the top people's tweeting, did you recognize? They're all entertainment. See, sports is entertainment. It's all, it's all entertainment. It's all entertainment. And when you realize that our teens consume nine hours of entertainment every day, Smartphones, TVs, music, nine hours a day. Nothing competes with that. The worldview that we, and adults, six hours a day, the worldview that we are consuming is the worldview that is coming from the entertainment industry. And it is an industry with no ought. It does not want an ought. Okay, uh, let me... Just summarize the rest of this. When this it was the second half, you're talking about the meta narrative. The postmodern thought, and there are very few people who would say they're a card carrying postmodern, postmodernist. But we bought the notion of postmodern. I'm gonna, I, we're gonna, I want to, you to see this definition. <clears throat> this is uh, Jean Francois Leotard. He's considered one of the founders of postmodernism. And he defines it this way. He says, simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern as, as incredulity toward meta-narratives. Well, what does that mean? You only need to know two words. Incredulity is not just a difference of opinion. It is a scoffing rejection, a scoffing rejection of the meta-narratives. And here's how they define the meta-narrative. A meta-narrative is any large story that pretends to give an all-encompassing explanation of anything, especially an overarching story of history and life in an attempt to legitimize some version of truth. So this is an attack on truth, and that's the cosmic battle that we looked at in the, in the Truth Project. But here's what, here's what is extremely important, this is what we're, we really needed to get to, should have gone here right from the beginning. What are we left with? If, if we reject the transcendent, if we reject the transcendent ought, if we reject the notion of a meta-narrative, there is a larger story, then the only story that is left, what story is left? If there isn't, what, pardon me? My story? Whatever I want it to be. No, my story. Yeah, my story. No, 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 my story. Yeah. My. <laughs> okay, so what happens in a culture rejects the ought, and the meta narrative is that we shrink into our own story, our own script. And it becomes all about me and all about my script. And I begin to invest everything in my script because the lie, I call this the, the, the Death Star lie of the enemy, 
The Death Star lie is you will be happy and content and pleasured and at peace if you can just get your script fulfilled. If he would just, if she would just, if they would just. And we, we write these scripts. And all of the negative emotions that we suffer from, I, I'm telling you right now, they all come from what we're talking about right now. If you believe that your script is going to bring you happiness and significance and peace and pleasure and all that stuff, and somebody steps on your script, what emotion do you think happens? Anger. That's exactly right. Next time you get angry, ask yourself if it's not because somebody just stepped on your script. Happens to me all the time when I'm driving. <laughs> Anger, disappointment, uh, worry. You know what worry is? Nobody stepped on my script yet, but I know they're going to. <laughs> complaining, complaining, complaining has to do with my script, and it's not going my way. Okay, so there's several consequences of this. Very, we'll, just, we'll just list them off. And if you want to talk, to, uh, talk about them later, we can. The first and the most serious is the loss of relationships. Because here's what happens. If I know that it's all about me, then I know something about you, that you think it's all about you. And my college students, I love college students, but I'm telling you, they know that. They know this cold as ice. I know something about you. I know that you're trying to manipulate me to enhance your script. And the reason I know you're trying to manipulate me to enhance your script is because I'm trying to manipulate you to enhance my script. And they see the world, they see everybody around them as a salesman, as a manipulator, with an agenda to enhance their script. And we live in this culture. And associated with that is the rise of skepticism. Because if you throw away all of that, it's all about me, it's all about my script, then when you tell me something, I'm skeptical. And I'm skeptical, why? Because you've got an agenda. Because we all have an agenda. It's all about our own script. And that's the world, this is the world now that we are called to engage. And the only way to engage this world, I'm absolutely convinced, and this is what we're going to drive to in the engagement, is to build deep relationships with people. And we have to get away from the notion that bigger is better, more is better. And we got to think the way Jesus acted. You know, I don't talk about Jesus and his disciples anymore. It's Jesus and his small group. <laughs> because that's exactly what he did. He came, he formed a small group, and I think, Felipe, I think, Felipe, I think it was you that rightly called out from Mark chapter 2 the thing that we would kind of skipped over. Guess who was in the home eating with the sinners and the tax collectors? It was Jesus and his small group. And his small group. Oh, I love you, man. <laughs> it was Jesus and his small group. If you look, just look through the Gospels now. The Sermon on the Mount, we all have this picture of Jesus. And, and Jesus went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and opening his mouth, he began to teach them, saying, Blessed Jesus was speaking to the disciples at the Sermon on the Mount. And, and listen to me carefully. For the Son of God, 12 was too many, because he boiled it down to three. And I think one of the schemes of the devil is to get us to go wide, broad, and, and never deep. I'm going to close with this. Because I know the bell is trying to ring. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of Rosario Butterfield. I encourage you to read her story. 
Let me tell it to you briefly. Rosario Butterfield represents what many of you and I would uh, think and look when we see many of these people today, especially those who are in the entertainment industry. Lost cause, I think. James, is that what you or heard somebody say that? Rosario Butterfield, <laughs> it was his lost cause. Okay, so here's a picture. Rosario Butterfield is lesbian, militant, atheistic, pro-abortion, professor in, an, in, a, in a big eastern university, a leader in the feminist movement, living with her partner, opposed to everything we would say is a biblical worldview, entrenched in it. She is now a pastor's wife homeschooling her children. And I don't know how, I don't know anybody who can travel that far or farther than that. How did that happen? It was not a silver bullet, and that's what, see, what, what the, when we lose that narrative, here's what's happened in Christianity. We shrink into what I call neo-Christianity or meo-Christianity. Christianity is basically all about me. It's about learning stuff, putting new stuff in my truth notebook, all, you know, writing blogs about what God has shown me and all that kind of stuff. That's good stuff. But, you know, you can come, become a dead sea. All that living water flowing in. That's not the way we were made. You know, we, we were made to be fruitful. And so a neighbor wrote her a letter. And Rosario was a neat freak. She said, at the end of the day, I, my desk was clean. And she said, now, I had two, two baskets. I had a love basket for mail that came in because she was prominent and she was, uh, she was a big name when it comes to all these issues. And then she had her hate basket, which I think was the trash can. Because she said, I either got love mail or I got hate mail. But she got a letter from her neighbor and she said, it irritated me because I, it sat on my desk. At the end of the day, I didn't know where to put it. Because I knew it was from a Christian, but it wasn't a hate letter. And so that sat on there. And then she says, I know what I'll do. Because he was asking to just have coffee. Can we just meet to have coffee? She said, I will meet with him because I'll get some more fodder, you know, in my speeches about these rabid right wing fundamentalist Bible thumping bigots and all that stuff. So she said, I'll meet with him. And then they met again. And again. And again and again and again. Until Rosario Butterfield was radically changed by the power of God through this patient building of a deep relationship. Rosario writes, or at least she said this, I remember. Uh, she said that this gentleman knew that he could only tell me truth as deep as our relationship was. And there is wisdom in that. We are called, as God's people, we are called to relationships. Why? Because our God is a God of relationship. And we live in a culture that has, it now is so lonely. We have, the millennial generation is afraid of relationships because they don't know, they contacts, they have contacts, but they don't have relationships. Because they don't know a real relationship. Why? Because they think everybody is a manipulator. How is that going to change? It's going to change over a long period of time by people who are patiently, lovingly building a relationship until you develop the trust and the understanding that you are not here because of your agenda. You're here because you really care about me. And that, my friends, is the door that is going to open up the transformation of our culture one neighbor at a time. Father, Oh, dear God, 
when we look uh, around us, this is, it's, not, it's not just a culture. It's, it is a mass of people who are in prison, who are shooting drugs, uh, who are getting STDs, who are murdering their babies, who are growing up without a dad and are almost doomed to gangs and prisons and a violent death. Oh, Father, we live in a culture that is screaming in agony around us. Oh, Father, would you move your people that we might begin to recognize you told us in the beginning what we were supposed to do. And it's not the big numbers. It's these deep relationships that you showed us what it was all about. Oh, Father, may it be so, not for our glory, but for your glory alone. Solideo glory, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.